Good morning, folks. Welcome. Well, at least it's morning where I'm from. <laughs> Who knows what time it is in your part of the world. Anyway, uh, from your part of the world, I would like to welcome you to my home state of Washington in the United States of America. It's tucked up in the upper left corner, some people might say. We're at an airport that I did not fly out of too often when I was in my early training, but I certainly knew it was there. This is the Falls City Airport near Snoqualmie Falls, Washington. Snoqualmie Falls is a, I think it's about a 200-foot waterfall. It is about 35 miles east of downtown Seattle, I want to say. Maybe a little less than that. And it is a, a tremendous waterfall. Uh, you probably may have seen a picture of it on the, my thumbnail. It's a, often a place where honeymooners will go. There's a big lodge called Salish Lodge, which is popular with honeymooners. Not only because it's a wonderful waterfall, but it so, has such proximity to the city of Seattle. I think someone once said it was three or five feet higher than Niagara Falls. Now, certainly not as impressive as Niagara Falls, certainly not on that scale, but um, that same type of uh, thunderous power at certain times of the year, especially after a good rain. Anyway, we're here in Falls City, Washington, not too far from North Bend, Washington, and Issaquah, Washington. And my plan is to fly to my home airport and talk a little bit about how I got started in aviation and uh, what I think is the absolute best way to learn to fly. So let's hop aboard this aircraft and get her fired up. Cessna 172, I believe this is a M model, 172 Mike. But I could be wrong on that. I'm trying to run the link between the flight simulator and my Logitech panels. I've had difficulty lately getting the panels to work. So I don't know if they'll work today. Gold and dark, of course. Oh, before I get too far, I want to go in and change the air traffic control settings. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to turn on air traffic control, which I don't often use. And I'm going to turn off um, AI com assisted communications. I absolutely hate assisted communications. Oh, didn't ask me to save. Interesting. Isn't it supposed to ask you to save? Well, it's not, uh, it's not killing me. Okay. Fantastic Orbix scenery. This is an Orbix airport. And I'm always surprised that an Australian company like Orbix chose Washington State as one of their first test beds of putting out scenery packages. And they put out quite a volume of scenery packages across a myriad of flight simulators. I'm just so happy that my home state was one they chose to focus on. And it is because, I'm sure it's because of the natural beauty of, of Washington State. I've toggled away the yoke. I'm going to be not quite as formal as uh, some folks, but we'll uh, get the beacon switch on. We don't have power on yet, so it's not going to do anything. Make sure the fuel cutoff is in the open position. Now, this can be deceiving. Um, I, I think there was a problem once where 
uh, pulling the cutoff out is supposed to restrict fuel to the engine, and and that's its secured position. But I've had an issue where pushing it in cuts the fuel out, and pulling it out is the normal position. Fuel tanks to both. Parking brake on. Throttle is to idle. Mixture full rich. This mic model does not have carb heat. Instead, it has a fuel pump. Most Cessnas don't have a fuel pump, and that's because the wings are higher than the engine, and the engine is gravity-fed. But uh, the mic model does not have a, a carb heat. It doesn't have a carburetor. It's got fuel injection instead of a carburetor. So um, they've decided to put a fuel pump in. But basically, it's just used for priming. So uh, we'll get the masters on. Oh, look at that. My SATIC panel switches do work. So that's good. Let's see if I can find the... Oh, I don't know what that switch was. There's the beacon light. And we will... Uh, take a look around. Make sure no one is approaching in the general vicinity. I'm going to crack my window here. If the window it looks like the window doesn't open. In real life, I would open that window a little bit. And with a good, hearty, healthy voice, I would holler, Clear pop! Which is an indication to all that watch the heck out. Give just a little bit of throbs, about a quarter inch of throttle. That's probably the... And I think what's happening is exactly what I mentioned, that fuel cutoff switch in should be fuel to the engine. Let's see what happens. Clear prop! There we go. Magnetos to both. There's a, This is a four-cylinder engine. Each cylinder's got two spark plugs. One on uh, the A, or one on the left, and one on the right. So when you say both, both spark plugs are firing. And there's two reasons for that. It's for redundancy and for maximum fuel burn. Um, so it's a safety precaution, and uh, when we do our run-up chest, we're gonna we're gonna uh, see how they operate on one s spark plug. But for right now, they're on two. Go ahead and fire up the avionics, and not gonna do any huge. Well, actually, I take that back. I do want to. Uh, oh, let's see if I can find the right camera. Oops. I thought I had a camera just for the avionics. There it is. Let's put uh, direct to... Renton Municipal. This is the Class D airspace, just a little southeast of Seattle. It's the home of the Boeing 737 and 757. This is what's called the standard body factory. A standard body aircraft is a commercial airliner with one aisleway down the middle. 
And the other factory in Washington State is up in Everett, Washington, about 40 miles north. That's called the Wide Body Factory. And the Wide Bodies include the 767, 777, 787 Dreamliner, and of course the Queen of the Skies, the Boeing 747. So let's get the transponder turned on. We'll put it to the altitude reporting mode. 1200 is a good VFR transponder code. So that looks good for right now. Again, I'm not going to be monstrously picky on the procedures. Taxi lights on, nav lights on. I don't believe there is an ATIS anywhere nearby. Let's see what I can find from on the radio here. Let's see what options I'm given. Oh, just, just uh, traffic. And we're going to depart to the west or south. Southwest. <laughs> One Whiskey Alpha 6 traffic Cessna November 405 Echo Romeo is taxiing to runway 27. Clear on the left, clear on the right. And let's get ourselves over to 27. I'm having to use the rudder and a little differential braking just to keep us off the grass. As I said, I've never flown out of Falls City Airport in real life. I don't know if they have a taxi back, if they have an actual taxiway or a taxi back. Uh, procedure. Oh. I'm going to end this flight and end this stream because I got myself caught up on a building. And we'll try it again. Well, folks, we're back. Had a little technical glitch there. I was caught up on the caught up on a building during my taxi. So I had to start all over again, but that's okay. Get our transponder on. Get the lights we need. Looks like our course to Renton is still in the uh, GPS. Whiskey Alpha 6 traffic Cessna November 405 Echo Romeo is taxiing to runway 27. 
Parking brake off. Rudder. Full deflection. No binding. Ailerons. Full deflection. No binding. Elevator. Full deflection. No binding. Just a little bit of throttle and we'll test out the the brakes. Come on. There we go. Okay, now let's see if we can get around to that runway without hitting that wingtip on the edge of the building. Looks to me like this might be an airport that does need a taxi back. Now, this is not common in the United States. to taxi back on our runway. But we'll check for traffic. Kind of hard to really check for traffic on a low wing airplane. You, the easiest way to check for traffic on a low wing airplane is to actually um, do it before you get to the intersection. This mountain is called Mount Psi, M-T-S-I. Most people call it Mount Sai, S-I-G-H, because by the time you've climbed to the top of it, you give out one big sigh. Oh, look at the way the wind is blowing the grass. I've never seen that before in Flight Simulator. The wind is blowing the grass. How fantastic is that? Anyway, um... So I learned to fly, I was mentioned in my title, the best way to learn to fly. Do what I do. First of all, start your flight training at a controlled airport. I learned at Renton, which is a controlled airport, Class D airspace. It's where the Boeing uh, standard body airplanes are built, the 3.7 and the 5.7. And big, wide runways. You've got a controller to watch after you. You've got uh, the whole learning curve about operating in a controlled environment, busy airspace with other airplanes. Um, best way to learn. And then something bad happened to me. My flight instructor got a job. Of course, you know, in aviation, you get a job offer. You take the first job offer that comes no matter what it is. Um, so he got a job and I said, well, I can go on with another flight instructor here or I can do something to help my flying I drove about 12 miles away to a small airport called Crest Air Park today the airport name has been changed I think it's called uh, Gant Field today but um, that's a airport like this one uncontrolled airspace very narrow little runways the runways aren't necessarily very level or even and uh, not a whole lot of traffic, but there's a tree line right next to the approach on both ends. And you really have to work on your piloting skills and your landing technique. Uh, although it didn't have the challenges of the big airport, it was unique in its own way. So that's the, se the second key. The first key is start your training in, a, in an environment that's it makes you learn, but yet it's safe and big, big wide runways, controller watching after you. Then finish your training, if you can, at a small airport where you've really got to get your, your uh, techniques down. And the third key, now I was lucky, my first flight instructor was from Scotland. And he had a bit of a brogue. And he would, he would say, for instance, Pitch for eighty, Brad. Pitch for eighty. You're going to kill us both. And to this day, I will never forget that Scottish brogue. And it really made lessons stick in my brain because I was able to, I, to uh, compartmentalize the lesson with that Scottish accent. 
and I'll always be thankful for that. Of course, in aviation, if you're a commercial pilot, a flight instructor, you're looking for any any job you can get, and usually the first job that comes along, no matter what it was, is, if they're going to pay you to fly, you take it. You get paid to fly. Okay, here we are at the run-up area. Let's set the parking brake. And as I mentioned, we're going to do a magneto check. We're going to bring the throttle up. 1200 RPM, I think was what we used to use. I don't remember. Maybe it was 15. Ah, yeah, it's 15 maybe. 1500 RPM. And I'm going to drop the magneto down on the left side. And look for a 100, 150 RPM drop. There it is. Go back to both. Back to 1500. Down to the right side. Looking for that 100 drop. And back to both. Okay. Looks like we're ready. This is a no flaps takeoff. Takeoff trim is set. One Whiskey Alpha 6 traffic Cessna November 405 Echo Romeo taking off runway 27 West departure. Landing light on, strobe light on, basically Christmas tree mode, every light on in the house. Parking brake off. And let's see if all those aerodynamic principles work and get ourselves in the air. Sixty-five on the climb out. Now I say pitch for eighty. I was learning to fly on a plane with a mile per hour on the airspeed indicator rather than knots, so my speed references were a little different. And that's another change that I made when I went to the smaller airfield. I um, changed over to a plane that was in knots, so I had to learn all those air speeds again like most airports now I know we're departing to the west I could have just stayed on runway heading actually I should have probably announced that I was gonna do a circuit in the pa in the pattern instead of departing to the west but one of the reasons I wanted to choose this field was I wanted to get a look at Snoqualmie Falls in Microsoft Flight Simulator. I'd seen Snoqualmie Falls in other simulators in X-Plane and in uh, FSX and P3D, but I'd never seen Snoqualmie Falls in Flight Simulator, and I believe this is it right ahead of us. There's a honeymoon lodge called honeymoon lodge called Salish Lodge, which is just to the left of it. And Snoqualmie Falls can look very impressive or not so impressive, depend on depending on the time of year and the amount of rain. Best time to come out to Snoqualmie Falls is just after a big rainstorm, because then the the falls will be at its thundering best. Well, this rendition of the falls is okay certainly not the best I've seen maybe some developer will 
we'll kick that up a notch. But it's good that it's there. And we can continue on to the west. We are under a shelf of airspace, the Class Bravo or B airspace to SeaTac Washington. I believe that airspace, the lower shelf is 3,500 feet. So as long as we're below 3,500 feet, this is a controlled airspace, but there's no reporting requirement for VFR aircraft. We are also in what's called a class or a uh, a mode C veil. The mode C veil means that whenever you're in this airspace, basically a 30 mile radius around SeaTac Airport, you're required to have a transponder capable of mode C. That's altitude reporting. So we do have a mode C altitude reporting transponder. And we are within 30 miles of SeaTac. So we're under the Class B shelf and we're inside the what's called the Mode C Veil. And the, if you're looking at a chart, the way to tell the Mode C Veil is to look for the purple shade on a 30 mile circle surrounding the Class B airspace. Class B airspace is identified by blue markings and remember Usually Class B is um, shaped in the form of an upside down wedding cake. Well, there's a city in the distance. I can't tell if that, that's probably Seattle. The only real two cities in this part of western Washington that have any type of skyline are Seattle, Washington and uh, Bellevue, Washington. Bellevue is the home of Pekar Corporation. Pekar is a rail car company. At least how, that's how they got their start. They also own two other tractor trailer truck building divisions. One is Kenworth, Kenworth USA. I believe there's also a Kenworth factory in Mexico. And Peterbilt. Uh, Peterbilt trucks are built in Denver, Colorado. And just like General Motors has, has several lines of cars and Ford Motor Company has the Mercury brand, uh, Packard Corporation builds both Kenworths and Peterbilts. So we're VFR, which means we need to stay visual. The rule for visual is a thousand feet from clouds, 500 feet below. I'm sorry, a thousand feet above, 500 feet below and 2000 feet from. I never really liked those rules for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's really, really hard to judge what a thousand feet looks like when you're flying. So your basic rule of thumb is even though you you have to know what the numbers are to pass a test or to pass a check ride, when you're flying, just stay clear of clouds. You'll generally be okay. Now that that means that we're in this particular day we're having to fly rather low and the other rule you need to follow is to stay 500 feet above people on the ground and uh, a thousand feet from uh, maybe it's 500 feet from the ground or a thousand feet from any person I think that's the rule it's been a it's been a very long time <laughs> since I um, did a check ride in a 172, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> oh my goodness, did I lose my did I lose my camera on my stream? I hope not. There we go. Gotta get that camera back.
I mentioned, I grew up in Washington State and I learned to fly in Washington State, but I myself am not in Washington today. I live in uh, Good thing about not having a carburetor is you don't have to worry about carb ice. Flying a, an engine with a carburetor, you're always, not to say you shouldn't keep an eye on the temperature gauge anyway, but you didn't have to watch it like a hawk, like you do uh, with a uh, carburetor. I think the rule was between zero degrees Fahrenheit and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the engine is susceptible to carburetor icing. Let's get an airport list. How about Renton, Washington, and we'll tune in ATIS. This is Class D Renton airspace. Information Alpha 1400 Zulu. Line 253 at 20. Visibility 5. Sky condition 1000 feet scattered. Temperature 15. 2.1 tree. QNH 29er decimal 9 or 2. Visual runway 34 in use. Landing and departing runway 34. VFR aircraft say direction of flight. All aircraft read back hold short instructions. Advise controller on initial contact you have alpha. Renton Tower Cessna November 405 Edna Romeo is 6 miles northeast 2,000 feet with Bravo to land. Cessna November 405 Edna Romeo Renton Tower. QNH 29er decimal 9er 2 wind 253 at 20. Enter left traffic runway 34. The simulator doesn't know this, but Renton Washington does not use left traffic. It's called a non standard pattern. Left traffic is what's referred to as a standard pattern, and when you're sitting in the left seat, it's easier to fly the left pattern because you can turn your head to the left and have better visibility of your position in the pattern. But some, and that's called a standard pattern. This is the south tip of Mercer Island just ahead of us. Uh, pattern altitude is 1,000 feet. So, uh, so we're going to descend to pattern altitude and we're going to be in right traffic, which is a non-standard pa uh, uh, pattern. And I believe the reason they do this here in Renton is because there's another airfield really close by, just a little northwest of this, is Boeing Field. Boeing Field is not owned by Boeing. It's a King County airport. But... That's where Boeing at one time built the famous legendary Boeing B-17 bomber, the big Boeing factory out there, uh, most prominent in World War II. And that's often today where test flights will happen. Now this particular airport is where the planes are built. This is the Boeing 737 factory. You can see it just off of uh, ahead of us on our, on our left. Um, Planes will never take off over the city of Renton. They always depart over the lake. This is Lake Washington. And they only take off during the daytime. And they only take off during uh, VMC, Visual Meteorological Conditions. They only take off when the weather's good. So, um, but at one time I had an apartment building overlooking one of the runways. And, I, of course, I couldn't be home all the time. But if I were home, I could have theoretically watched the takeoff of every brand new 737 and every brand new 747. This is Interstate 405 Freeway just ahead of us. In, in the, whenever there's traffic congestion, these curves in the freeway, these are called the Renton Curves. We're at pattern altitude. Here's where we'd usually do a landing check to make sure our lights are on and our gear is down. Cessna 5, 
Echo Romeo wind 253 at 20. Clear to land runway 34. Clear to land runway 34 Cessna 5, Echo Romeo. So we're on downwind. Ahead of us is the Auburn Valley. Out there in the distance is the Auburn Space Center. That's where Auburn, back in the late 60s, mid 60s, would work on components for NASA and the space program. I think parts to the lunar rover were, uh, if I don't know, I don't know if they were built, but I thought I heard read a story where they were designed out there. Okay, let's cut power. Let's add a notch of, once we are uh, get ourselves in flap range, we'll add a notch of flaps. Turn base. There's the Valley Medical Center, Valley Hospital. That's a reporting point. If you're flying in here, there's what's called a VFR transition over there. SeaTac Airport is just ahead of us. If you want to fly VFR to Puget Sound and beyond, you would use what's called a VFR transition. And reporting the hospital is a very common reporting point. Back when I learned to fly, there was one corridor. Today, there are two corridors. They're called the the Mariner Transition and the Seahawk Transition, named after the two big sports teams here. Okay, well, somehow we flew our base a little too long <laughs> and we're a little too low. <laughs> That's okay. That's what I get for talking. So we'll kick up the power. We'll add in the rest of the flaps. This is what's referred to in the aviation vernacular as dragging it in. It's when you're what's called behind the power curve. Just shy of the runway are the sports fields for Renton High School. There's downtown Seattle to the very far left, ahead of us to the left. I mentioned the tip of Mercer Island just beyond the lake, or actually in the it's an island in the lake. And some of the wealthiest people in Washington live on Mercer Island. Just beyond the runway is the Wiley Post seaplane base. Uh, float planes regularly operate from Renton little tractor will tow them into the water. You can see some of the unfinished Boeing airplanes that line the runway. Usually those are identified by their green slime green color. We are high. And I'm going to taxi down to where I learned to fly, a place called Pro Flight Aviation, which is down here. Now, when I first started learning to fly, they were here at midfield, kind of where that white van is located there on our right hand side. But in later years, after I moved on to the, to the uh, smaller airport, Crest Air Park, they had moved to this location in the south, on the southwest corner of the field.
just an amazing group of people, an amazing place to learn to fly. The great thing about learning to fly in Washington is that it's so landmark intensive. There's you know, the shorelines and the mountains and and uh, the man-made uh, structures. So um, really, really uh, gra grateful to have those experiences. So out here in the corner of the airport is Pro Flight Aviation. And I would pull her up. Shut her down and get out a little hand tow bar so I could point the nose in the outbound direction. I can even help out with that a little bit today, but usually you would just nose up and then use a tow bar to get it turned around. We'll just turn around here. Parking brake on. Lights off. Avionics off. And we'll pull the mixture. Magneto's off. Master switch off. And I will thank you for joining the stream.